seven policemen were killed, mostly by friendly fire. The Chicago Times called the workers ragtag and bobtailed cutthroats of beals above from the Rhine, the Danube, the Vistula, and the Elbe. Labor's largest paper called them wild beasts. The respected Albany Law Review called them long-haired, wild-eyed, bad-smelling, atheistic, reckless foreign wretches. It was front-page news around the world. Remember, Chicago is the world's window into the future. People from around the world really saw it as what city life was going to be like for them, perhaps 10 or 20 years down the road. And when you got into the labor violence, what appeared to be proletarian riots, it was very frightening to people in many places around the world. Throughout the nation, Americans were almost unanimous in favor of the utmost repression of the anarchists. There was a belief that American civic institutions were being threatened to their core. Foreign-born workers under the leadership of anarchists were seen to be a threat of the first order. The very next day, martial law was declared in Chicago. A law is passed saying that no more than two people can be standing on a street corner to talk. If there's three, you can arrest them. And homes are entered without search warrants. All the union newspapers are closed down. Um, hundreds, literally hundreds of labor leaders are put in the different city jails. After Haymarket, the city went crazy. This is a real red hunt, and it's the first American red hunt. They know that everyone they're rounding up is not an anarchist. They're rounding up labor agitators. They're out to crush the labor movement, which is the threat here, more than the anarchists. They can handle them. They can hang them and shoot them. In many ways, this is, for them, an opportunity. They can paint them with a brush of anarchism and go after them like that. They didn't belong to the human race, poet Carl Sandburg, a child at the time, would recall. They seemed more like slimy animals who prowl, sneak, and kill in the dark. I didn't hear anyone in our town who didn't so believe. Eight were charged with murder and conspiracy. They included Albert Parsons, who had fled to Wisconsin, but returned. Here's a man who's rather naive, don't you think? He sits up there in Wisconsin and he says, well, this is America and, and the justice system will prove me to be right. And so I'll come down, I'll talk about anarchism, I'll explain that I was five blocks away in a tavern with my wife, uh, and the jury will, you know, let me go. Judge Joseph E. Gary presided over the trial. Well, there was such fury about the case that there was no effort made to find a, a fair jury. The bailiff was sent out to, to find people and bring them in as potential jurors. And of course, he found people who were deeply prejudiced. It wasn't hard at the time. And I'm sure the bailiff rejected anybody who showed any sympathy. 